What's good everybody and welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons and today I'm going to show you how to draw and color a whirlpool. Now I'm going to start off showing you guys how to draw a whirlpool and then we're going to get to the coloring portion later. But in advance, here are all the supplies you're going to need for this video. So I'm using Canson Bristol paper, I'm using my HB pencil, and to color this I'm going to be using Copic markers. I'm going to be using B23, B26, B39, and C9, cool gray number 9. And I'm also going to be using a paint pen. I'm going to be using a white one for this video. So that's what you'll need to color, but we're going to put these away for now. But for now, let's get to drawing the whirlpool. So let's keep in mind that water doesn't have a definite shape because water is always moving in some direction. So to draw this whirlpool, I'm going to start off on this side and make sort of like a hill kind of shape. So this right there kind of marks the movement of the water. And now to draw like a little whirlpool, I'm going to make this the main subject of this drawing. So the whirlpool would be, so the way I like to draw a whirlpool is to make like a big hole. Because when you think about it, when a whirlpool spins, it kind of sinks whatever's in it to the bottom of the ocean. That kind of thing. Kind of like a drain when it's draining water out. Or a toilet when you flush it. So it makes sort of like a hole. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm also going to make some sort of a shadow just to indicate that when I color this later there's gonna be shadow in this hole so yeah and then I'm gonna make like another wave behind it something similar to what I'm doing over here but instead it'll be behind it but just like this, it'll also have movement. So we're going to apply movement to this wave as well. Let me erase this real quick. Okay. And then on this circle, to make like a little swirling movement of water, we're actually going to come off of some part of the circle and make a line like this. So we're going to make lines just like this, but we're going to make them throughout just to help indicate the movement of the water. So let's start off on this part of the circle here. Make sort of like a swirling pattern, just like this. And then let's kind of start in the same area, like a little bit off, but like right about here. And then we're going to keep that swirling kind of line, but also follow the contours of the wave that we drew at first. Just like that. And let's do it on this side as well. And this time I'm actually going to follow the contours of this whole shape. Because it still works. Because when you think about it, let's say I move this line over here, it'd still be a curve. And we're also capturing the movement of the water at the same time, so it still works. And then let's do the same thing, but we're not going to see much of it because it goes off the page. And now we're onto this wave that's back here. We can also capture that movement as well. So let's make a few lines that also follow the contours, like so. So I'm going to start off the edge of the page and come this way. like so and then there's gonna be shadows here too because again this wave is behind the main wave so let me just uh, sketch in some minor shadows this way and then if you want to put like another wave over here just to help fill that negative space you can do that And then some shadow here. And then what I'm doing now is just uh, touching up some lines, kind of confirming which lines I want to use when I go to color this thing. 
Okay, so that's looking pretty good to me. I got all the shadows, I got all the contours that I need, and at this point, I think we're ready to color. So I'm gonna leave the sketch lines there, and I'm just gonna erase them to the point where they're barely visible. I'm not gonna erase them completely, but like we're gonna keep them on the page so that way we know what exactly we're coloring and where exactly the shadows are gonna go, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna grab my needed eraser and do just that. Of course the shadows might not be as visible on the camera as they do if you're doing this at home but we still know where they are kind of visually but now we're on to our coloring portion so I'm gonna grab my base color which is B23 and just color in literally everything so I'm gonna start with this back wave first and if you want you can actually use your marker and make strokes that follow the lines that we drew at first. Because you see how these line strokes are kind of matching the lines that we drew to help accent the movement of the water? That you can do with your Copic markers. Or any marker, whatever you have. But yeah, that's definitely something you can do. So now let me color in the hole. Now we can get this back wave in. Okay, and see how I accented the movement of the water by using the marker? Again, that's something you don't have to do, but it kind of looks illustrious and looks beautiful when you think about it. But while you still have your base color, what you can do to help indicate the shadows is by layering. So here's one layer of marker. We're gonna use the same color and help indicate the shadows. So like we're kind of reestablishing where the shadows are with just our base color. It won't really do much, especially when it dries, but we will be using this later to help blend the other colors. So we got shadows here, here, and along here as well. And then over here in the foreground, we can add shadows there. So I'm gonna just color those in with uh, different strokes actually, because since I captured the movement of the water by making similar strokes to the line work, then I can just go in, in a whole another direction and also layer at the same time. So we captured the shadows. They may disappear later when it dries, but we know where they are now. So now let's grab my mid-tone, which is B26, and just go over the shadowy parts. So this B26 is like a darker version of this B23 color, but it's dark enough so that I can blend it together later. So I'm going to apply this in some areas that don't require shadow. That way when I go to add my darker colors, it'll really start to define where the shadows are in the piece. So like there's some shadow right there. And then also on the contours like I did here. And let's get some in the foreground too. And then let's try to make some lines to help indicate the movements of the water. Kind of like um, remaking our initial lines when we did the sketching portion. So you don't have to remember every exact line that you make, but again, this is movement of the water and water doesn't have a definite shape. So you can really just place lines anywhere as long as they indicate the correct movement or at least the movement that you're going for. So let me just fill in this hole with this color. And then let me apply some movement over here to this wave. And some to this wave. Not much, but yeah. But now let's go in with one of our darker colors, which is B39. Well, one of them is B39. And I'm just gonna add this color to the actual shadows. So unlike what I did with the B26 and added it along the contours, we're not gonna apply this color 
to the contours, only to the shadows because it's one of our darkest colors. See how we got that shadow in and then there's some shadow right next to it so we can throw that in. And then we can add some shadows along the foreground. And then some shadows in this hole as well. That one we may have to add some darker shadows to but we can do that in a minute. But for now, while we still have the B39, let's actually darken the movement of the water too. So these movement lines, we can apply this B39. And then here, and then these back waves too. And yeah. So now let's stop for a minute and go backwards. So we're going to use our B26 to blend out the B39. And so that way all the colors really work together. Okay, so now that everything is blended, now what we can do is add shadows and everything to the main subject of the drawing, which would be the whirlpool. And that we can use our C9 for, because we already applied B39, but it doesn't look that dark compared to all the shadows that we added to the waves back here. So let's add C9 to this mix. Just apply that on to each edge of the hole. Then let's use B39 to help blend it. And then let's use B26 to blend it all together. So the base color that's here right now, we're not going to see that anymore. So we want this hole to kind of be darker compared to everything else in the drawing. So let's cover that base color up with our B26, blend it together. And if you want to elevate the shades a little bit more, you can definitely do that. All you got to do is follow the same steps, just apply them into more areas. But with that being said, let's move on to adding some more accents to the movement of the water. So I'm going to use my paint pen now, but before I do, we're going to give that a little shake. Okay. So where will we be applying this paint pen? So we can apply it onto these movement lines, but we're not going to overdo the paint pen a lot because there's a lot of movement lines within the drawing. We're not going to apply this paint pen to every single movement line, just the ones that need it. So like over here in the foreground, we can apply this paint pen here. And then we can also come back to the foreground you know do the same thing so it's kind of like uh, soapy bubbles when you think about it but not exactly because what kind of ocean has soap in it and then we can add it to this next one over here here dot here too dot here and then we can add it to here as well and really you can just scribble this I should have said this in the beginning but you you don't have to be too precise with this paint pen line because you see I just scribbled this entire area here you don't have to be um, 
you don't have to be a perfectionist when it comes to that. But yeah, we can also add this to here. Um, thicken that line just a little bit, but also show some shadows. I know I didn't do that here, but we can do that here while we still have the chance. And then let's also add some over here. That way there's some balance in the drawing because you see I applied a lot of it over here. So let's provide like an equal amount to the other half of this drawing over here. So I already did that down here. So let's apply just a little bit more up here to the wave behind it. And then there's a lot of shadow over here in this area. So what I'm going to do to help separate those shadows is to apply this paint pen starting with the stopping point. Like the contour that separates this wave from this wave. I'm going to start there and just add some accents here. And then I'm also going to do that to the, the wave that's like the main subject of the drawing. So I'm going to help separate that out with just a few lines here in the middle. You know, because there's a lot of darkness over there. So let's try to get rid of some of that by doing this. And then a tiny amount over here. And then maybe a little dot here, dot here, and dot here. So we're pretty much done at this point, but what I'm doing now is kind of, uh, since I have this white paint pen still, I'm just gonna fix up some lines because obviously I went outside the lines during the video, so I'm just using this paint pen to fix it up, but that's, the, that's also an option to you as an artist. If you're comfortable with going outside the lines, then you know, by all means, but I'm just going to fix up a few lines. No big deal. Not like you have to do this, but this is just like my preference or whatever. But yeah, but as you can see, I did leave out the sky. But if you do want to learn how to color the sky, I got two videos on how to draw four different kinds of skies. One is public here on YouTube. The other is exclusive on my Patreon. So link in the description to get to my Patreon. But the public video is available in my how to draw backgrounds and scenes playlist, which will pop up right here in the card. And there will be a link in the outro as well. What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today I'm going to show you how to draw the human leg. And it's not as simple as you think it would, but I'm going to show you how to do it in the simplest way possible. And that way you can get it right every time. So let me show you. I drew a semicircle up here and that's going to be the pelvis. That's where the legs are going to start. And so what I like to do first, now that we got this drawn, I'm going to draw a circle right inside of it. But the circle is going to be sort of towards this side because this is going to be the bottom. So I'm just going to draw a circle towards uh, the right side. And then I'm just going to draw a dot right here in the middle. So to map out the shape of the leg, I'm just going to draw a dot right here in the middle. And I'm just going to draw a line sort of curved out. And that's the thigh muscle. Let's make it a little bit longer. And then right here is the halfway point of the leg. So that's where the knee is going to lie. And then once we draw the bottom of the leg, that's going to be sort of the opposite way. So the entire thing is going to be sort of an S shape. And then down here is going to be the foot. So now that we got those drawn, let's start out and draw the leg. So the back part of the leg here is going to be straight. And then the thigh muscle is going to kind of curve out like so sort of like a parenthesis shape and then once we get towards the halfway point of the leg that's where the knee is going to be so we're going to draw the knee I'm just going to draw sort of like another part of the knee about right here and I'm just going to add some shading to it after we draw the knee, it's going to kind of be straight down from here. So we're going to make that part a little bit straight. Because the leg only bends 
from the knee outward. It doesn't bend like this way, sort of, if that, if that makes sense. So when, you're drawing, so when you're drawing the bottom of the leg, try not to make it go towards this way too much, even though this guideline kind of points to the opposite direction of where the knee bends. Okay, so the back of the leg. So now that we got this halfway point in, we're gonna map out the halfway point between the knee and the ankle. This is where the calf muscles come into place. So the calf muscle comes in right, about right here. And then once we got that in place, it kind of lines up with the ankle so we can make that a little bit uh, straighter. And it kind of tapers so you can make this area a little bit smaller down here. And then down here we can start to draw the foot. And then the ankle will be about right here. And then once we got the entire leg in place, we already drew it up. I want to take the right contours like right around here. And I like to repeat that process only for the right side of the leg. So the knee shape will be the same. Everything on the right side of this leg will kind of be the same. Just so I can make it look like there's two legs and they're, they're supposed to be. So can just shade this other leg here. Since we're gonna see this leg the, uh, first and we can add shading to this other one that we drew. And then let me try to erase these guy lines because we don't need them anymore. And there you go, that's how you draw the human leg. What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons and today I'm going to show you how to create a sky in Procreate. Now as you can see here, I got a little background drawn of a beach and I have the entire area of the sky being completely blank. And what you see here in the corner is my color palette and that's what I'm going to use to help create this sky. Now for this video, I'm going to be constructing three different skies with three different sets of colors, which is what's here in the color palette in the top right hand corner. But let's go to my layers. And here's what they look like. So I have one layer for the color palette, one for the line work, and then all the colors of the beach would be in this group layer. And then I have my sketch, which we're not gonna use today. And then, yeah, we're pretty much ready to create the sky. So what we're gonna do first is give another color to the background color, which is this bottom layer here. Now this is the layer you get when you're pretty much making any Procreate document. So I'm gonna click here. I'm just gonna set that to this light blue color that's over here in the corner. I'm gonna try to match that as close as I can make it. Okay, I think, I think that's close enough, I should say. Okay, now we're gonna use this light blue as a base color, which is why it's in this bottom layer. So now what we're gonna do is create another layer. And in this row of colors that I have for this light blue sky, we're gonna be using this white and then this other like darker, more saturated blue. So I'm gonna use my white first. So I'm gonna tap and hold on it to select it. Then I'm gonna grab my big, huge, large airbrush. And I'm gonna apply this white to the bottom portion of this layer. So I'm gonna make a line that goes straight across. The line doesn't have to be super straight because we'll be blurring this later. So we're just gonna fill the bottom portion with just this white. and just color that in. And then we're gonna select on the blue, so we're gonna tap on the screen to the blue. And then we're gonna do the same thing with that same brush, but over at the top. Okay, now since the white and the blue are on its own layer, what we can do now is blur them. So I'm gonna go up here to my magic wand tool and then we're gonna select Gaussian Blur. And to activate this blur, we're gonna take our pencil and move from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. So I'm gonna do just that. And as you can see, this blur is kind of taking effect. Like so. And then let's pick a stopping point, which is right about here. 
and then we're gonna tap on the magic wand tool again to deselect and we're good but now I feel this guy has too much white and that's something we can easily fix so having that layer still selected I'm gonna go to the arrow tool and as you can see there's a bunch of dotted lines with anchor points and that's gonna help us somewhat reposition the colors of the sky so I'm gonna set this to freeform so that way I can kind of stretch it because I want to move this white down a bit so I'm gonna take this bottom point over here and just move that layer down just give that a little bit of a stretch because I want the white to still show just not as much so I'm really just stretching that and stretch it out some more and I think that's pretty good so I'm gonna hit the arrow again to deselect and there that's what our sky looks like unfortunately I don't have any clouds to put in here but if you do want to put clouds into this illustration then by all means but for now we're just gonna leave that out because we're just focusing on the sky today but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete this layer now and we're gonna do the same thing with a sunset sky so let's go back to our background color and we're gonna make that this base color that's this yellow okay so now that the base color is a yellow now what I'm gonna do is make a whole nother layer and then I'm just going to apply all these other colors to the yellow. So as you can see, I have some red, uh, vermilion, and then some sort of orange here. And we're going to apply those colors the way we did with the blue and the white. So I'm going to select this red. Use my big, huge, large airbrush. And apply that close to the top. Now I'm going to do the same thing with this vermilion. And apply that slightly lower. And then the same thing with the orange. And we're going to leave some of that yellow visible at the bottom. We're going to do what we did again and go to our magic wand tool, the Gaussian blur, and then move from left to right to help blend those colors together. And you don't want to end up blending it too much, so that's why you want to go to like 50 or 60%. So that way some of that red is still visible. But that looks like it's in a good spot, so let me deselect. And that looks pretty good. But if you end up with a different result, all you gotta do is go to this arrow and just make sure it's on free form and then just stretch this end in case you wanna extend the length of the colors. So that's what this beach looks like at a sunset. But now let's take this layer off again and we're gonna change the background color again to this dark blue because now we're gonna apply a night sky to this thing. But for this night sky, it's gonna have some sort of a pink mixed into it. So we're gonna do what we did with the first sky and have a light color at the bottom and a dark color at the top. So the base color would be this blue that's right here in the middle. So let's go back to our background color and select that blue. Oh, it didn't let me okay close enough so we already got some night colors going already so now let's add another layer and then we're gonna select the pink first and apply that pink close to the bottom and everywhere underneath the sand that we can't see and let's apply more of it up here as well now let's select the blue the dark blue and apply it close to the top you can also do this with a black since this is a night sky, but you don't want to go too dark with it, but black is also an option. So now that the blue is applied, let's go to our magic wand tool, Gaussian blur, and blur those two colors. That way the pink down here is blending with the base color blue, and so is the dark blue blending in with the base color of the blue. And that way all these colors blend together. And there we go. And you see I did my best to kind of beautify that by adding this pink color because you don't often see the color pink in a night sky but but you know it's always nice to look at. So I switched it back to a regular sky and let me take off this color palette layer again so that way you guys can see what it looks like without it. And yeah that's pretty much it. That's how you create a sky in Procreate. So what's good everybody welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons and today I'm going to show you how to color 
four different types of skies. And for this video, I'm gonna show you how to do it with Copic markers, and you're going to need a lot of Copic markers for this video. But every single Copic marker that you'll need for this video will be listed somewhere on the screen, but this is a lot. But I'll just break it down into a few parts. Like for each sky, you'll probably need like four or five, but one of them, you're gonna need a whole lot of colors for because we're gonna be doing a sunset sky as well. But we're gonna start with some basics, and then towards the end of the video, it's gonna get a little bit challenging. So, let's get to it. Okay, so the first sky that we're gonna draw, we're gonna draw just the basic sky, your basic blue sky. So the colors you'll need are B00, B01, B02, and B05. You could also use B04, but I don't have a B04, so B05 is my next best thing. So, let's get to it, to it actually. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay down my base color of my B00. So um, you can use either the chisel tip or the brush tip to do just that. You won't necessarily have to go um, uh, very precise with it, or you don't have to actually lay down the entire box. Um, that's what I actually have here is a bunch of boxes. So what I'm gonna do for now is I'm just gonna go um, making horizontal lines just like this. Because that's what the sky uh, pattern kind of looks like. I mean, it wouldn't look right if there were a bunch of um, vertical lines going up and down like this. I mean, you can do it in that way, but I feel this way is a bit easier. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my darkest color, ooh, which is B05. I'm just going to go over the top, just like this. We're not going to add too many layers to the top, to this top dark color because um, this B05 is kind of hard to blend with the B02 because I don't have a B04. So in my case, I wouldn't have to add too many layers of the B05 because it'd be harder to blend if I did. Um, for now, we can go on to add our B02. Um, we can use a chisel tip for this as well. Okay, and now it's starting to get a bit filled in. So let's try to go a bit closer to the bottom. Okay, and then we're gonna transition to our a little bit uh, lower color, which is uh, B01. I, meant, I said lower color, I meant lighter color. And it does look a little bit greenish. At least the way I'm viewing it. I don't know if you can see it on camera, but this is a good color combination for a fairly blue sky. And then we can go back with our base color and blend it back into what we did in the beginning. And now we can try to do our same process over again but try to make this gradient a bit longer. What I mean by that is, um, see how we did with the uh, BO2? We kind of went right about here. So let's try to go like a little bit lower, like say down to here a bit. But we don't necessarily have to go very, very low, just low enough so, we, um, so it'd be a believable sky. And at this point, we don't have to really blend as much as we did earlier. And there, that's your uh, basic blue sky. Um, let's transition to the other square so I can show you guys how to do a night sky. Okay, now for this night sky, you're only gonna need three colors. You're gonna need B37, B39, and C9. This is a cool grade number nine. Okay, so like usual, we're gonna take our base color and give ourselves a wet layer for the other markers to work on top of to make it easy to blend. And again, we're gonna continue with horizontal lines just to get started. And then we're gonna go with our B39. 
and again going over top just like so and we're gonna try to go very very low like say two-thirds of the way there and it does kind of look like two completely different blues but that's okay because we're gonna um, we're gonna smoothen it out all later okay and then we're gonna take our initial blue and blend it back in with that um, with that darker blue and we're gonna try to work in streaks so it, that way it can stay smooth and just just keep going with it okay so that's looking pretty smooth down there but now let's try to get a bit smooth up here but before we go into add the b39 again adding another layer on top of that we're going to go with our c9 and make it darker that way it saves us the trouble of adding b39 again after a second time i mean okay and then here is our second time and just to, reiter just to reiterate, we're trying to do this just once. So just keep working over top the cool gray. It'll blend with the blue. So that way it gets a bit darker. And then we can apply our B37 one last time. And let's try to go over top of everything this time. And that way there is a good gradient. And then if you want, I'm gonna take my gel pen and kinda of add some stars for a night sky. I mean the ink will probably be, be wet still because we just we like we just finished up, so I can uh I mean you won't see a lot of the gel pen. It's either that or this thing is kinda of old. So Add some stars. Alright, and there is your night sky. So let me transition to the next square so I can show you how to do a sunset. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to do a sunset sky. The colors you'll need for this one are YR09, R08, YR07, YR04, and Y35. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our Y35 and just start from the bottom this time. And again with the streaks we're going on a horizontal line direction. And we're not going to go completely up, we're just going to stop around halfway. And then we're going to take our reddest red which is uh, YR09. I'm gonna cover not much of it. Let's say we're gonna stop right about there. Okay, and then we're gonna go to R08. I'm just gonna add a little bit of red there. Then YR07. And this is the point that we're going to start and get into that yellow. So we can add some stuff there. And then we're going to go to our YR04. Okay. And then that leaves us with the rest of the yellow that we can use to uh, make another layer on it. And blend it back into that orange that we just laid down and then we're just going to keep going in a horizontal line back and forth until we get that blend that we want okay and it looks like the r08 looks more like a an actual red so let's go ahead and change that so r08 is going at the top now We're gonna switch that so R09 comes next. I mean, why R09 comes next? And then why R07 and why R04? 
And let's try to get some of that wire 07 into that R08. Okay, and then one more layer of the Y35. And again, we're gonna keep going until we get a good gradient. And there, that's a smooth sunset Copic gradient. Now I'm gonna show you how to do one more sky and bear with me because it's confusing as hell and we're gonna use a lot of colors for it. So stick with me. Okay, so for this final sky, I'm going to show you how to do another sunset, but this time it's going to incorporate a little bit of purple into it. And for this guy, we're going to use eight colors, and those eight colors are V06, RV19, RV29, R27, R08, YR07, YR16 and Y38 <laughs> yeah that's a lot of colors but as you can see the color caps they kind of look like that entire gradient that we're just about to color so let's do it but instead of doing what we did earlier by laying down a base color and then working our way backwards and forwards from there we're actually gonna start with the top color and then work our way down and just keep blending in between so what we can do is we're gonna start off with our V08 at the top and we're not going to add too much of it. You can add as many layers as you need to, but we're going to pretty much stop there. Okay. But instead of going to RV19, which is our next color, we're going to go to RV29. We're going to kind of skip ahead. And we can make this come down a little bit because we're almost halfway there. Okay. And then we can use RV19 to blend those two colors together. Okay, and then we can take our V06 and blend that back in. And it's gonna look a little bit dark, but that's how it's supposed to look. Or at least that's how I did it <laughs> prior to making this video. Okay, so as you can see, there's a smooth gradient going on here, which means we're getting somewhere. Okay, so our next color would be R27, and we're going to use that, and this is the kind of red that would transition from this um, magenta color towards the colors that we used for this previous sky, to like our um, actual warm colors. But before we get to those, we're going to come back to our RV29 and blend that red back in. Okay, and then our next color would be R08. So again, this is another transition color that would bring us towards our warm uh, reds and yellows. Our warmer colors, actually. Okay, so again, we're not going to apply too much of it. Or too much of it going down, actually. I don't know how else to word it, but we're not going to come down with it too much. Okay, so next is our YR07. And just keep going back and forth until we get a good blend. Okay, and our next color is YR16. And this is our, again, a transition color from this orange and red to our final color, which will be a yellow. And then that will be our Y38, which will be our yellow with the yellow. Um, whatever you want to call it, it'll just be a yellow for now. Okay, and if anything doesn't look right, you can just go back to it. Like the YR07, that looks a little bit shabby. And the R08 as well. 
and as you can see there's a uh, sunset and stuff going on which incorporates some pink but it's not exactly pink but it's a red violet so it's kind of like a pink but not exactly and it also incorporates some purple which I mentioned before so that's initially what we were going and that's what we successfully made by using Copic markers also if you do plan on adding uh, clouds to this type of sky a color that I would use personally would be the BV08 but that's totally up to preference I'm not gonna waste time adding clouds to the sky because that's not what this video is about so that's going to do it for my entire video on coloring four different types of skies. An entire list of all the coping markers that I used for this video will pop up somewhere on the screen. And I'll also break this video up into sections so you can see which coping markers I used for which sky, which will be easier. But What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today I'm going to show you how to color with colored pencils. Now for this video, I'm going to be using Prismacolor brand colored pencils. You can also use Arteza, Faber-Castell Polychromos, whatever other colored pencil brand that you have. But for this video, I'm using Prismacolors. So the colors I'll be using are PC-916 Canary Yellow, PC-1002 Yellowed Orange, PC-918 Orange, PC-922 Poppy Red, and PC 924 Crimson Red. So those are the colors I'll be using to color in this box that you see in my sketchbook right here. And I got nothing else left to say, so let's get started. So before we get into using the colored pencils, I'm gonna set them aside for now. What I am gonna do is take my ruler here and divide this shape into five equal parts. So this shape goes all the way up to the number 19, and I'm gonna divide that by five because I have five colored pencils here. So when I take 19 and divide it by five, I get a number that's just under the number four. So it's about 3.8, so what I'm gonna do is make a dot above this shape. So it's 3.8, 7.6, 11.4, and 15.2, okay? So inside of each of these brackets is where I'll be applying each color when I go to blend them. But now that we have that divided, we can go ahead and put our ruler and everything away. And now let's grab our colored pencils. So this canary yellow color, that's gonna be my base color. So what I'm gonna do is apply this to the entire shape. And I don't know if you're able to see this on camera, but I'm just scribbling in this entire area. And I'm just being sure to cover everything because we're gonna need the entire space. And if you want, you can apply a whole nother layer on top of it, just so this yellow is more visible. Okay, so now that I got this yellow on the paper, I'm going to set that aside for now. I'm going to grab my mid-tone now, which is this yellowed orange color. And then I'm going to start here at this section and begin to scribble some of that orange in. And when I apply this orange, I'm working on top of um, two or three layers of this yellow that I already applied. So you want to push down on this pencil as much as you can just to make this orange visible. This task shouldn't be too hard because yellow itself is already a light color. So it's easy to see this orange come up on the page. And also I forgot to mention that when you're using colored pencils, try to go in one direction and then add another direction. So as you just saw, I went in this direction with my colored pencils, and now I'm going in a whole nother direction, or the opposite direction, as I'm adding a whole nother layer with this same color, just to help smoothen these strokes. Because I don't want my finished piece to all go in one direction. I don't want that. I don't like that look. Okay, and then back at this section, what we can do is apply light pressure so that way this orange kind of blends in with the layer underneath it, this yellow. So right here, I'm just going in a circular motion. And as I'm going back and forth, I'm kind of adding a little bit more pressure to it. So that way I don't apply too much colored pencil and I don't apply too less, if that makes sense. 
So now this entire layer of orange blends in with the layer underneath it, this yellow. Alright, so now I'm done with that. Let's grab our next color and do the same thing. And as we're grabbing our next colors, we end up pushing harder on the pencils because we're working on top of several layers of pencil already. So like in this area, there would be about three or four layers. So I gotta push harder on this pencil just to help make this visible. And then I gotta push over here in this area too. Push harder. And I'm going in that one direction. And then I'm gonna go in a whole another direction just to help smoothen that out. I mean, in this case, it's already smooth, but I'm gonna do this just in case, just to help set a good example. And besides, I need to go over this area anyway just to add more pressure. And now we're done using that. Let's go in with our next color and do the same thing. And with this color, I'm applying even more pressure. So that way this red is now visible and still able to blend with the colors underneath it. And then just color that in. I'm going in a circular motion so that way I don't have to worry about going over it in a whole nother direction again. Oh, circles, circles, circles. Okay. And now let's apply our last color, which is this crimson red. Going over in a circular motion, covering that area. And I'm applying a very large amount of pressure to the pencil. So I'm gonna start off at this end. I'm gonna apply a crazy amount of pressure. And I'm just gonna go like an up and down kind of direction. So that way as I work back this way, all the colors would have been fully blended together easily. So apply a lot of pressure here. Okay, and then we can also go over this area again just to get rid of some of those white spots that you don't wanna see. But it might not be fully achievable, but you can still get a close enough result by doing this. And now let's grab our second to last color and blend it back into the red that we just finished applying. So let's start by blending that in. By adding a large amount of pressure to that. And add a circular motion as we get closer to the other color to help it blend. And then start adding multiple layers for this section. Okay, and then you can also go back into our previous red and kind of blend this color in just to help kind of stretch those colors or stretch the blend area actually.
Yeah, so we got a good enough blend area. And now let's go in with our next previous color, which is this orange, or actually our mid-tone. And start to add more pressure. But first, let's get that blended. And just uh, expand the blending area by going into the previous color. And once you do that, you should be good. Okay, so now being done applying this color, let's go to our next color, which is this yellowed orange, our second to lightest color. And I'm just gonna go in a circular motion as I go towards this color here. Apply lots of pressure. If you go in one direction, go in the opposite. Because as you do it, you're applying more pressure, which is what you want to do. And now a little tip that I want to throw out there for you guys. This area here kind of looks like it's just one color and then another. So what you can do is take the color that you used previously and kind of go in a circular motion. But at the same time, add very light pressure to kind of blend this previous color into the one you just finished applying. So like with this one, I'm just going in a circular motion and adding light pressure. And then as I do that, I'm kind of building up on pressure. So that way I don't add too much of this uh, of this color. But I'm trying to blend it in with this color underneath it. But do keep in mind that we are working on top of several other layers. So sometimes you've got to immediately press hard. But the reason I apply light pressure at first is because me personally, I don't know my own strength. So that's why I try to, uh, you know, start from the ground up if that makes sense. And then also getting rid of these white spots over here. Okay, and then once you finish that, you can go in with that one color and blend it back in. Okay, and then now we're on to our last color, our base color actually, which is this canary yellow. So what I'm gonna do now is since this section over here has only one, two, or three layers over here, I'm gonna apply a lot of pressure and also build up on layers as I do it. So that way I can kinda sorta blend into this next orange. And then I'm going to take my previous color and sort of blend that by going in a circular motion. Okay, and that looks like a good enough blend. So now I can go back with my yellow and start adding pressure to that one section. And then just uh, achieve a good blend out of these two colors. See, as I'm applying this base color of a yellow, I'm kind of overlapping the orange that I just applied and kind of going into that, but not exactly. So that's a good enough blend. So now I can go back in with our actual section and apply that same pressure. And if the blending still seems off, all you gotta do is repeat those same steps. So this is my second to lightest color. And I'm just gonna continue going in a light pressure at first and kind of blending in with that yellow. Just make it super light. I know I'm going outside of the blending area, but um, 
this still it still kind of helps and then once I'm done with that color I can just go back in with my yellow and apply light pressure to this yellow as I blend it in with this area And then I can also go back into this section with the yellow so that way it still kind of blends as it transitions to this color. Okay, and you can do that same step with all the other sections as well. Like over here with my red, there's still some white spots available, but I'm not going to fix that right now. But yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you color with color pencils. What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today, I'm going to show you how to color sand with markers and colored pencils. Mixed media. So, I'll be using Copic markers for this video. And the Copic markers you'll need are E31. I have this marker as a Copic Classic marker or a Copic Original, as some people say. And a Copic Chow marker. This one has a brush tip for it, so it helps me with the blending. And I also have this one, so it can help me fill in a large area without losing a lot of ink. Because this one has a limited amount of ink. Very limited. So, that's why I have two of them. You're also going to need E33, E35 and E37 to help get some blending in place. And also, since sand does have a grainy texture, I am gonna be using some colored pencils to help get some texture in place and also to help with the blending so that it looks somewhat smooth but also get some texture in place. So the colored pencils serve two purposes, to help get a grainy texture in place and to help with the shading. And I'm using a mixture of both Arteza and Prismacolor colored pencils. So I'm using like a pretty light brown and more of a sienna brown for this one. So I'm using like a light brown for it and I'm also using a sienna brown. But of course you can use any other color that you think may work for this one. But with that being said, let's get started. So what I have here is a sand castle and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, E31 marker. I'm just going to fill in this entire area. All right, now that All right, so now that that's in place, I'm going to begin to use my E33 and just blot in, you know, like um anywhere that I think would uh, need shades and also some parts that don't because this is like a mid-tone to me. So I'm just going to apply this pretty much everywhere. And then I could just blend it out later. I can apply more of this mid-tone color to the places that will need shades, like say the shades will be towards the right hand side. So I'll apply more of this ink towards the right. Like say, here I have this much ink on this side, I have this much ink on that side. Because in a way, this kind of increases the wetness of the ink, which makes it easy to blend darker colors. All right, and now I'm just gonna go back with my initial color and blend it all together. All right, so a lot of the blending we just did, we're not gonna see a lot of it yet because we pretty much didn't do anything yet. But now we can apply more of the darker shades. So we can start with either our darkest or our second to darkest. Um, so right now I'm going to start with my darkest so so I can see that I'm getting some shades in place because it looks to me like we didn't really do anything like I just said. So I'm just going to apply my E37 to the darkest shades which again are towards the right hand side. And then also the little like transition to the ground. I'm just going to apply some of this color towards that. And also some of the battlements, I'm going to apply shades to those. Okay, and that shade is looking pretty dark compared to what we did earlier. So now I'm going to apply my 
what I'm gonna call my transition color to help that blend into the initial color. So my E35 marker, which I just applied, it's a little bit low on ink. And you know what? It actually served a purpose. And you know what? That dried marker look helps show the grain of the sand in some sort of way. But now that that's down, we can go back with our initial color, which is E31, and just blend it all back together. All right, so this is what the sand castle looks like now. But of course the blending doesn't look the best. So that's why we have our colored pencils. So again, I have two colored pencils. I have a light brown and a dark brown. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with the light brown and then work our way towards the darker brown. And you can also use any other additional colors if necessary, but I'm just gonna stick with these two for now. So to help me do that, I'm just gonna go lightly. So what I'm gonna do with the colored pencil, I'm gonna start off with the dark, I'm gonna start off where the darker shades are. And then I'm gonna slowly work towards our base color. And then I'm also going in a circular motion so that way so that way none of the colored pencil strokes would show. And I'm gonna do that to the entire drawing. But I'm gonna try to at least cover up some of the blending with just this one for now. And then we can work our way to the darker one later. See, that's looking a little better, but not uh, the best. Well, but do keep in mind, we, ha we haven't applied our other colored pencil yet, so we still gotta do that. But for now, we're just gonna stick with this one, so. All right, now that we apply our light brown to pretty much the entire piece, certain parts I didn't cover, but that's what I did. I'm gonna go on with my darker brown. It's just not very, very dark brown, but it's similar to the darkest shade that I put down here. But it's similar to my E37 uh, Copic marker. And I'm gonna apply a little bit more pressure to it compared to how I applied my other colored pencil. All right, so the dark color pencil really did make a change with the shading, and it did help get a more grainy feeling to this sand castle. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my darkest marker. I'm not gonna do anything big, because we're done with that now. We're pretty much done here. But now I'm just gonna add like a few spots here and there. Just like this. Nothing big, just you can add them pretty much everywhere. You can make it look exactly like sand. And you don't even got to do it with your darkest colors. You can pretty much do it with like, now I'm, I'm going to take out like a pinkish color that's also a mixture of like a little bit of a brown. But this is also a Copic marker. It's E04. I'm going to apply that here and there as well. Get sort of a pinkish feeling going on. But you won't see much of a difference unless you actually look at it closely. But after you do that, that's pretty much how you color sand. So What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons and today I'm going to show you how to remove this guy from a photo like this in Adobe Photoshop. Now as you can see I have a picture of a tree that I took and it has a sky background. What we're going to do in this video is get rid of the sky which leaves us with an opportunity to add a whole another sky to this photo. Now I have this image loaded up into Photoshop and we're ready to get started. 
So what I'm going to do first is go over here to where it says channels. It should be right here next to layers. And by default, my document is formatted in RGB, red, green, blue. So since the sky in this photo is blue, we're going to be messing with just the blue channel right here. Now the reason that we're messing with the blue channel is for one, the sky in this photo is blue, right? And if I toggle visibility on these other channels, you can see that on this thumbnail here that the subject or the leaves on this tree, they're somewhat black and grayish and same with this building down here. So what we're going to do with this channel is we're going to turn this into a black and white image. So we're going to mess with our levels in Photoshop. If you know what that is, I'll show you how to use it. So we're going to be messing with our levels so that way we can turn this image into just black and white. So, but before we do that, we're going to make a copy of this blue channel. So we can do that by clicking and dragging all the way to the bottom where this plus symbol is down here. And we have a copy of that blue channel. And now to open our levels, we can use the keyboard shortcut command L and it'll bring up a window that looks like this. Now by default, where it says output levels, it should be a black and a white. And it should say 0 and 255. 0 for black, 255 for white. If it doesn't say that for some reason, then make sure it looks like this. And if it does, great. But by default, it should. So we're going to go back up here to input levels. And we're going to play around with these little sliders here. And make sure preview is on so that way you can see what you're doing. So you're going to adjust these sliders so that way the subjects are black and the sky is white. So let's play around with these a little bit. And now we're making some progress here. All right, and now it looks like our leaves, the street light in the building are now completely black. And the sky background is now completely white. Now, as you can see, there is some white over here on the street light. And later on, I'll show you something cool you can do with layer masks. So after doing that, we can hit OK on this levels window. And now after doing that, we can drag this copy of this blue channel down here to this dotted circle icon down here. And what this does is it selects everything that's white on this channel. So I'm going to let go right here. And now as you can see, it selected everything on this channel that's white. Okay. So now I'm going to toggle visibility on that channel specifically. Actually, it won't let me. I got to make everything else visible. Okay. But now we don't want that red there because we still have our copy of our blue channel still visible. So we're going to make that invisible. And now we're going to go back to layers. And we're going to make sure this is unlocked. So I'm going to click this lock icon to unlock that layer. And now we're going to create a layer mask for that layer. So we can do that by hitting this little button down here that looks like the flag for Japan. <laughs> now, that's a weird way. That's a weird thing to say in this video, but it looks like this. You can create a layer mask by clicking this button. And as you can see, we created a layer mask with just the sky. So the good news is we can see that everything that we had selected is completely blue. Everything that's the color of the sky and the clouds, that's now selected. But the bad news is that it's the exact opposite of what we want. We want the subject selected. But a cool way to fix that would be going to this layer mask that's right here next to our initial layer. It should be black and white like this. And what you can do is use the keyboard shortcut Command I to invert that layer. So instead, the subject right here will be white and the sky will be black. So let me hit Command I real quick. And there we go. So now we have our subject, which is the tree, the street lights, and the building with the sky being masked out instead of the subject. But if I zoom in on the street light down here, we can see that we have some parts of the street light that are masked out that we don't want. So I'm going to go over here to my paintbrush tool. And then I'm going to select just a random brush here. I'm going to make sure I'm using the white color. And then let me zoom in on this area right here. And then I can paint in all the details of the street light. And that's something cool you can do with layer masks. 
So if when you did the last step and you have a selection that you didn't want, you can simply paint in some of those details using either a black or a white, or for some reason, whatever color the layer mask is. In my case, it's black and white. So I'm using the white to paint in the details that I don't want masked out. Like right here on the street light, I'm painting that in. And down here. And if for whatever reason I want some parts of the sky to still be visible, I can still use this white to kind of override the layer mask and be like, hey, I want this visible and whatnot, yada, yada, yada. But in this case, I don't want that, so I'm going to hit Command Z to undo those. And if there are some parts of the leaves in this case or the building that I want masked out, I can simply paint over that with the black. Or I can just use my selection tool or one of my selection tools and just use the paint bucket like that. That's something super cool you can do with layer masks. But I don't want it to look like that so I'm going to hit command Z to undo those. Now what I'm going to do is Google search a picture, a random picture of a sky. I'm going to copy and paste this so I'm going to right click and copy. Go back to Photoshop and then hit Command V to paste it and it makes a whole new layer with that sky that we just selected and you can resize that, recolor it, do whatever you want with it. But overall make sure it's behind everything. So I'm going to hit the enter button to confirm its placement and now I'm going to move this layer underneath everything. And now I'm free to move this sky wherever I want it in my document and if I place it right here it looks as if nothing really happened it pretty much looks like the same sky that we started out with so what I am gonna do is I'm gonna save this image and real quick I'm gonna put this image up along with the original image so you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of what we did in today's video And yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you remove the sky from a tree photo like this in Adobe Photoshop. So what's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoon. And today I'm gonna show you how to draw a plus size person. So as you can see, I got the face and the body guidelines that we'll need for this video. Um, the face I'm not gonna really discuss because this video is mainly on the body. So I'm just gonna focus today's video on the body and not so much of the face. But if you do wanna learn how to draw the face, I made videos on how to draw the face shape face at a center view, face at a three quarter view, and whatever other ones that I can't name right now. So yeah, links to those videos will be in the description down below, and there will be a link to one of those videos popping up in the card right here. But anyways, let's get to drawing the body. But to start off, we're gonna work from the torso and work down, so let's do it. All right, so as you can see, I got a hip and shoulder kind of pose going on, and the whole figure looks like a stick figure, and that's what I call guidelines because I have this figure at a certain pose and that's what I'm going to use for this video so to start off we're going to draw a woman by the way so we're going to start off sort of up here like see where this joint is the shoulder we're going to start off up here I'm going to draw the breasts and draw another one right here Okay, and we're going to curve inwards, still matching the direction of this line. And this part of the body will kind of be creased because, and as you can see, this um, portion of this pose is kind of more stretched compared to this side. So it's going to look as if it's kind of squished. So that's what the body's going to kind of look like. So we're going to stop here. We're going to get rid of this line. We can come from here and go around the hip and then make our way towards the knee. Okay, and then we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. Make sure we can curve around because this is a plus size person. We can go around the hip and make it as big as however we want. So again, work around the hip, 
and comes just before the knee. It's still gonna it's still gonna be considered the knee, but again, this is a plus size person. Okay, and then right in the center, that's gonna be the crotch. That's all I want to say. And then we're gonna come off of the crotch and match the direction of this line here. So that way, so that way this line works with the direction that we have everything else, if that makes sense. Now we can come even lower and again matching the shape of this guideline. And when you're drawing legs, they kind of taper in the end. What I mean by that is when you come off of the knee, you're going to want to go towards the foot. And that's what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to do the same thing coming from here. But except this is where the calf muscle is going to be. So it's going to be sort of a curve here. And then we can just sketch it in the foot really quickly. And see, as you can see, compared to the size of the thigh that's up here, the width of this ankle is completely different. That's what I mean by tapering, because it gets shorter going down, okay? And then we're gonna work the same way with this leg, but at this position, we can make this part of the leg straight. And then again, with the calf muscle, we can kind of curve it in. And then sketching the foot really fast and then let's add some details to the legs so right here where the knee is I'm gonna erase that portion really quickly and I'm just gonna sketch in like a small kneecap also one right here too and then maybe add like a small curve and see what that does and see that kind of works for the drawing so let me zoom back out so you guys can see what I got so far so that's pretty much the body already drawn all that's pretty much left to all that's left to do is the arms. So let me, so let's come back up here to the arms. So we're gonna come off of the neck. Sorry. We're gonna come off of the neck. And we're gonna include the same curves that we would do for the legs, except the mechanics are, except the mechanics are a little bit different. But we're not going to talk about that. Okay, so the curves of the arm, the way I like to draw them. And then it comes off of the hip. And then I can just make a small hand movement up here. And then let's move to the other side. So it's gonna be a little bit different, this hand movement, but this is specifically about the body. It's just something extra that we can add. So again, we can start off at the top where the neck is. We're gonna curve up for the shoulder. And then include the same curves for the arm while also following the direction of this guideline here.
All right, and that's how you draw a plus size person. So what's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today I'm gonna show you how to draw mountains. Now mountains are somewhat shaped like triangles. And because of that, we're gonna make these mountains out of triangular pyramids. Now the reason I say triangular pyramids is because when you're looking at reference images of a mountain, let's say it's light source, let's assume it'll be the sun. So the sun is shining upon the mountains, wherever it is in the sky, and one side will be lit up and the other side will have deep dark shades. So with whatever reference images of mountains you find on the internet, you can see that a mountain will be split in half between lights and darks. So when we get to the coloring portion of this video, I'll be able to give you guys a visual representation of what I'm talking about. But for now, let's get started. So I'm gonna take my color erase pencil and I'm just gonna draw like a, Just like a, a triangle shape, sort of like a, a dune. Like a dune shape, but still a triangle. And a triangle usually has three sides, so I'm just gonna draw the two pointy ends, but then the bottom one I'm gonna leave blank because I wanna draw several different mountains that are kinda surrounding it. So let's draw another one behind it. Yes, the yeah. So we're um, when we're starting to draw mountains, we're gonna draw some triangle shapes, but um, they're gonna be kind of distorted because usually a triangle is has straight edges like this. The triangles that I'm drawing have curved edges like this. Actually, let me make this one a little bit bigger. And then I could probably put one over here. Yeah. And then just fill that in. Okay, so there's our initial shapes for our mountains. You can choose to make the peaks of the mountain. You can choose to make those sharp, but obviously they don't have to be. Okay, so now we're gonna split each of these triangles in half, but we're not gonna do it directly down the middle like we would a regular triangle. So when we split mountains in half, well, first of all, mountains are not man-made. So instead of a mountain being an exact triangle like it would be, it's actually formed by rock, formed by the earth or whatever. So it's not gonna be a specific shape as if we humans created mountains. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna give it sort of like a jagged edge. Kinda like this. So what I'm doing to get these jagged edges is I'm putting my pencil to the paper and then I'm moving it around, like twisting it, something like this with my fingers. So that's what I'm doing down here because you don't need to, you don't need to necessarily get this perfect but just make sure that these lines are not super straight so let's do that with the other mountains too and I'll walk you through it too so just twist you can even go in a zigzag pattern while you're twisting it so go up and down up and down like so go in your little zigzag pattern like that Okay, and on this mountain, we're not gonna see it, so we can leave that alone. Unless you want a small portion over here to be seen, that's totally up to you. Okay, so now that we got the lines that help split the light and the dark side of the mountain in half, we're actually gonna go off of this line and match the contours of each mountain. So you see this line for the edge? We're gonna kinda mimic that shape coming off of this line that splits it in half like this so kind of 
So with my mountain, it goes out, then back in, and then goes away. It disappears behind this mountain. So I'm not gonna apply that with every single edge of this line. I'm actually gonna provide a few lines here and there. like so and we're gonna do that with all the other mountains too okay and then actually let me fix this tip real quick cuz I think I want to fix that give it like a soft tip Okay, and then this edge of the mountain, since we can't define the halfway point, we do know that this side would have these lines. And then let's do it with the foreground mountain too. Okay, so we pretty much got our mountains drawn already. You can leave it like this if you want. The sketch is already done. But what I am going to do is I'm going to ink this in time lapse and then come back to you guys and show you guys how to add some color. Okay, so the inking portion is done and now we're ready to color. So I'm going to use markers today. And I'm using a combination of Copic markers and the Ahuhu markers. The colors I'm using are a colorless blender. I'm using the Ahuhu brand. The Copic brand could also work, but in my case, that one's out of ink. So I'm using the Ahuhu brand colorless blender. Um, I'm using BV02, BV34, BV04, and then an Ahuhu marker. This is a P5 Aubergine, Aubergine, that, and then C5. So those are what I'm gonna be using to color these mountains. I'm gonna do it with one of the mountains and then time lapse the rest of the drawing to save time. All right, so I'm gonna grab my BV02. And then what I'm gonna do is um, just flick up like this. I'm gonna apply lots of layers down here because down here close to where the bottom of the mountain is, that's where most of the shades are gonna go. But this is just the base color. So we're gonna add the shades later, but for now we're just gonna um, take this marker ink close to the top, but the top of this mountain, that will be a white. So that's why I have my colorless blender. So we're not gonna go all the way to the top with this marker, but close enough to the top so we can apply the colorless blender. So we're actually gonna go all the way around the mountain too. See how we're getting that effect already. Okay, and now we can use our colorless blender and try to blend those strokes out. Okay, so I think I got a good enough blend to the white. Now we can begin adding our shades. So let's go to our BV34 and add a slightly darker color. I think this will take more effect when we add the darker shades because this is an in-between color. So let's use our BV04. Yeah, see, that has a darker value, so we can use this. Okay, and now we can add our darkest color, which is P5, a Huhu brand. 
and we can just apply this close to the bottom of the mountain. We can apply it in a big, large area so that we have room to blend it. So I'd say about here is a good spot. And then right here. All right, and now we can work backwards. So let's use our BV04 and blend this color out. Okay, and now let's use our BV34. Hopefully it'll work this time. Okay, now we can use our last color, which is BV02. And we gave ourselves room to blend this without exactly going into the white. So that's a good thing. Let's try to mix that in as well as we can. Okay, and then if you have to, you can go back to your colorless blender and blend the white. So now we're at this point of coloring the mountain, we're not exactly done yet because now we can really determine where our light source is. So the reason I colored this and then said light source is because I know for a fact that the shades are close to the bottom of the mountain, which is down here. Now, like I said from the beginning, the presumed light source, which would be the sun, will be shining on one end of the mountain. One side will be dark, the other would be light. So now we can determine where exactly the sun is shining. Will it be on this side and shining upon this part of the mountain? Or will it be on this side and shining on this part of the mountain? That you can determine right now. In my case, I'm gonna have the sun over here in this corner shining upon this part of the mountain. So we'll be applying our shades to this portion, this side that doesn't have all this texture. So I'm gonna use my C5 and give it a dark value. And then just make everything dark. So I'm gonna uh, take this C5 and blend it with this um, with this purple down here. And then we can use our BV34. Helps blend with the gray, so why not? Then we could use BV04. Blend this back in. And then let's use our darkest color, which is P5. And kind of extend this shading a little bit higher on the mountain. And then we're going to take our BV04 and try to blend that in with the other colors. Now we got BV34 and I think this would be it in terms of the color. Alright, and now you can kind of see that that mountain looks very realistic. So normally I don't really go for the realistic look, but that's good enough to me. But what I am going to do now in terms of highlights, I'm going to use my white colored pencil. You probably see this in all my videos, but I'm going to apply that to the textured lines, especially down here where it's dark, so that way it'll be, it'll be seen.
See, like, because the Prismacolor colored pencils act like paint. So that's why in the dark areas, this is really where it would show up. And then the white parts, white on top of white really won't be seen. But you get the gist of it. That's really how you do it. Okay, so now I'm going to apply this concept to the rest of the drawing so you can see everything with all the colors. So here's the finished drawing. I hope you guys like how it turned out because I personally love it myself. But I did leave the sky out. But if you do want to learn how to color the sky, I got two videos on how to draw the sky. One video is public here on YouTube. I'll put a link right here and in the outro. And the other is exclusive over on my Patreon. So there will be a link in the description to get there. But with that being said, that's about it. That's how you draw mountains. So What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today, I'm going to show you three different ways to draw bathing suits. Before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that for this video, you're going to need some models drawn, which I already have drawn here. But if you do want to learn how to draw anything related to the female body, I've got videos on how to draw the female torso, how to draw a plus size girl, how to draw female legs, how to draw the female face, and a whole lot more. So if you want any tips on drawing the body or the model or anything else related to that, there will be links in the card throughout this video and there will be links in the description as well. But yeah, you are gonna need models just like these for this video. But with that being said, let's get started. So for this first one, I'm just gonna draw like a regular, normal uh, type bathing suit, like a two piece, but it's known like a two piece, but it's called under wire. Let me show you. So it's gonna have like a, so she's gonna have like a wire bra. And then we're just gonna go around like so. Connect them in between. Alright, so we got one part of it. Now the other part is like the bikini, I want to say. But it rests on the hips. Not the waist, but the hips. And it's pretty self-explanatory on how to draw it. And that's what I mean by a two piece, but the specific name for it is under wire. All right, so that's one way to draw a bathing suit. So let me switch to another model so I can show you guys how to do another one. This next kind of bathing suit is pretty straightforward. It's actually the easiest one to draw out of the ones that I'm doing today. This one's actually the most simple. So it's just, it's just a regular, normal, one-piece bathing suit. So the way to do that is to make like a U-cup or like the neckline and then make some straps on it. And then it's just like how we did for this one, except it's all together. So it covers up the entire torso.
All right, so that's another way to draw a bathing suit. Let me switch to this last model so I can show you guys another way. This next bathing suit is also a two-piece like the first one we did, but it's called a flounce, and there's something a little bit different to it. It still has the bikini bottom down here, but it's a little something up here with the bra that's slightly off. So let me show you. So the bra part of the bathing suit, it looks like a mini skirt. So it goes straight, so the elastic band goes straight across like so, and then it comes off of the breasts. It makes sort of like a, a skirt shape and provides some wrinkles to the flounce. And then just a normal like bikini and it still rests on the hips. Not so much as the waist. This is my favorite one. But there you go, that's three ways of drawing bathing suits. What's good everybody, welcome back to Cadillac Cartoon. And today I'm gonna to show you how to draw a mermaid. Now a mermaid is pretty much a fully fledged character. And the first thing you're gonna need when drawing any kind of character, typically a human character, you're gonna need a plan. So as you can see on my page here, I have the face already drawn here, all those guidelines to indicate the face, and then I have all these stick lines to look like a stick figure, and that's what you're gonna need to draw like a human character pretty much, or anthropomorphic character. Because if this weren't here, and I were to start to draw the mermaid right here, right now, I wouldn't know how the different body parts move, and then I'd be forcing a lot of last minute decisions on myself, which I don't wanna do, especially in a video tutorial like this. So if you wanna draw a mermaid along with me and you don't wanna use this pose, I recommend looking up reference photos like on Google, on Pinterest, and get that movement in place before you get to drawing the mermaid. All you gotta do is draw some stick lines, like here I got um, a couple of movement lines for the arms, and since the mermaid doesn't have regular human legs and feet, all I have is just this line of action here because that's gonna be the tail but yeah the first thing you're gonna need for drawing a mermaid or pretty much any character is your plan how is each body part going to move think about all that before you get to drawing any kind of human character but since I already have mine down we can get started okay so I zoomed in on the face and what I am gonna do is draw in some eyes on this little horizontal guideline here And the eyes that I like to draw, my specific style of eyes, they're, uh, they look like the top bun of a hamburger. So that's why I'm drawing the eyes like this. And then when drawing female eyes, because I'm drawing a female character in this video, I like to have a piece of mascara coming off of the eyes. It's gonna look somewhat like a brush stroke coming off of the eye, something like this, but I'm gonna do it on this side too so you guys can see that better. So just a piece of mascara. And then along this arch here, I like to have that being a little bit thick. Like that. And then right here on the face where the horizontal and vertical lines intersect, that's where the nose is gonna start. And it's going to curve off of this eye right here. Just draw in like a little nose. And then right below that nose and also along this line. There's going to be a mouth. And then the chin. Okay. So that's pretty much the face in a nutshell. And then right above everything, I'm gonna draw in some eyebrows. Like that. And then when I draw my eyebrows, I like to have them super thick, coming close to the middle of the face. And then as you're drawing it away from the face, it'll taper at the end, so it'll eventually come to a point while you're drawing it, or at least the way I'm drawing it. So, see it being super thick over here. 
then it's gonna come to a point like that and then just color that in okay and then I like to show her cheeks too just drawing like a couple cheek lines on the eyes make her look excited and happy nothing wrong with that okay and then while we're still up here I can just draw in a random hairstyle for this mermaid character if you want to draw a different hairstyle too um, feel free up to you I'm not limiting you to what you can do when drawing a mermaid character because as an artist the possibilities are endless Okay, and typically when you're looking up references of mermaids online, you would see that they have like a little starfish or a little flower in their hair. So what I'm going to do for my character is I'm going to draw like a little flower, like right on this side of her hair. And let me erase a few things so that way I can see what I'm doing. You can also draw a starfish. Again, I'm not limiting you to what you can do, but you know, that's another idea. I'm just going to keep throwing ideas to you guys. Don't know when it's going to happen, but yeah, I'm going to just keep throwing ideas for you guys. Like, here's a... I'm going to put six petals on this flower. And it's going to look somewhat like a starfish when you first look at it. Maybe the color can determine that too. And speaking of which, I'm going to color this later, so... Um, just drawing the flower in. Don't know what color that's going to be yet, but I'll develop that when I get there. Cross that bridge when I come to it, I guess. Okay, so now that we got all that drawn, let's move down and begin to draw the torso. So the female torso is not hard to do, but we do have a stopping point down here, which is what this line is on this line of action here. So that's our stopping point. It's right there by the hand. So what I'm going to do to draw the female torso is I'm going to match this same curve just for the torso. Then make some sort of an S curve on this side. And then finish it off down here. Okay. And then I'm going to give this female character some breasts too. So I'm just going to draw in some breasts. Just fix the shape of the torso. And then just draw another breast on this side. Like that. So we got the female torso drawn. But let's come back up here to draw the neck and shoulders. Well, the neck is already drawn, but let's make the shoulders. Like that. And then when we draw the shoulders, when we make our line, it's going to go around this little circle joint. Okay. And then when we draw the elbow, it's also going to go around the circle. So it's not going to touch it at all. And then when we draw the forearm, it's going to make somewhat of a straight line, just like the guideline. Okay. And then the inside of the forearm is going to make somewhat of a curve like this. And then come inwards to make the hand, which we're going to do in a second. So now it's looking more like an arm. Okay, and then now let's uh, finish creating the arm. I just make it a little line like this. And then just erasing that torso line up there. And then erasing this torso line too. Okay, and then while we're still up here, we can draw in another line. And then I forgot to put like a little point on this line here to indicate the elbow. I got my green pencil here, I can do that now. Just draw like a little circle. That's the elbow, it's halfway point of the arm. So 
So all we gotta do is draw that in. And I'm gonna have the arm kind of taper as it comes close to the elbow, but not exactly taper. It's just gonna come inward some more. So you see how wide this arm is? Like you can't see much of it because of the torso, but here's the width of the arm up here. And now here's the width of the arm down here close to the elbow. As you can see, there is a difference, not much of a difference, but that's what I mean when I said taper, so I kind of misspoke. But it's not going to be as wide up here as it is down here close to the uh, elbow. Okay. And then after we made those lines going to the elbow, I'm going to start up there. Make a curve coming out. And then coming back in to make the wrist. And do the same thing on the other side. like that and then for now I'm just gonna draw in a random hand movement for this character but in advance if you do want to learn how to draw different hand movements I have three videos on how to draw hands two of them are public on YouTube the other is exclusive on patreon so there will be links to both of those public hand videos in the description on this video and there will also be a link to my patreon so you can get to that exclusive how to draw hands video but for now, I'm just going to draw in just a random hand movement for this mermaid character. On both hands, actually. I just finished this one. Hopefully, you can see that with all the guidelines in the way. But... Just draw in like a random hand down here. Like that. Specifically, you don't have to do what I'm doing, but again, the choice is yours, what you're going to do with the hands. And now let's transition lower so I can show you guys how to do the mermaid tail. Now, to some people, the mermaid tail may be their favorite part of drawing a mermaid because it's easier to draw than the human legs and feet because it's usually just one big line. But we're going to start here at the torso and make sort of a curved line like this that goes to the center line. And then it's gonna, this hand is in the way, but it's gonna make some sort of a hood shape connecting the female torso with the fish tail, or the mermaid tail in this case. So it's gonna look somewhat like hoods. If you've seen my How to Draw Hoods video, then I'm making the same thing here. And then doing the same thing right here. So again, that hood shape will be connecting the human body with the mermaid tail like this apologize if you can't see it behind this hand but that's the way I drew it okay and then after drawing that we can begin to draw the tail so the movement of the tail will match this line of action here it's gonna make this curve so the tail will be bent back that way and all we got left to do is draw it so I'm going to start the tail right up here and then eventually I'm going to match this line so that way we can capture that movement. And then I'm going to have the tail coming past this line like that. And then the back of the tail will pretty much match this uh, line of action here. So big giant curve. Adjust it however. And the way the tail is drawn, it looks equal on both sides. When we're supposed to see more of this side than this side. So, all we gotta do is make some adjustments. And then we can come inwards on this side. So that way it kind of makes more sense. like that and now we see more of the tail on this side than this side so now it makes much more sense okay so now we can begin to draw the tail fins so you can pretty much freelance those they're pretty uh self-explanatory if you ask me just a little uh just a bunch of freelance curves like that okay 
And now I forgot to do this one drawing the torso, but we got to add a bra to this character. So let's come back up to the torso. I'm going to draw like a, a bra that's similar to Ariel's bra, where it looks like parts of a clamshell. So I'm going to start here at the center line. And just make a bra shape. And just draw lines on it to make it look like a clamshell. Okay, and now let's erase the contours. And just fix those so that way it kind of looks like Ariel's bra. Yeah, so now it looks like she's under the sea. Okay. And now these two parts of the bra can be connected using like a little pearl. That's just one of those other ideas that I can just throw out there to you guys. And then, speaking of pearls, we can have like the bra straps being made of pearls. So a little bra strap coming around the neck. Just a series of circles being pearls. And then the back of the bra. Hopefully I can get some of that in there. And yeah. And then you can have some of the breasts showing. So I'm just draw like a little Y shape up here. You probably can't see it because it's over top of the center line here. Okay, and if the belly button is shown, which it probably won't be because it's behind the hand in this case. Just draw like a little belly button there. But let's come back down to the tail. And just draw in some scales if you want. Just um, fill that blank space because it just looks very empty to me. You don't have to necessarily fill it, but I just feel that we can add some sorts of lines that indicate scales. Because, you know, mermaid tails have scales. So just um, a bunch of letter U shapes here and there. Just like a, a pyramid kind of pattern. So I'm making three then two, then one. That's what I like to do. Or I can start off with four, then three, two, one, or start off at five, then three, two, one, still making a pyramid. So right now I'm doing four, three, two, and then one. And then if I wanna add a small pattern there, I can just do three, two, one, or just two and one. But if you want to draw every single scale on the mermaid tail, that's up to you. But personally, I'm not going to. And then I'm just going to add some texture onto this part of the tail that connects uh, the human part with the mermaid tail. Add some texture there. Just a couple of lines. Alright, and now we can zoom back out to see what we got. All right, and here's what our mermaid character looks like thus far. So at this stage, you can change up anything that you want. You can change up the hairstyle if you want, change the flower to like a starfish if you want. That's just another idea I can throw out there to you guys. Um, change up the bra, make that look a little different. Add some jewelry to the arms and hands if you want. Change, do whatever else you want to do with the mermaid tail. And yeah, so whatever accessories you want to add to the mermaid, do it now. Because what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to ink this drawing, give it some color, and show you guys what that looks like. And I'm going to do that in time lapse so I don't make the video super long. So, let's go.
All right, and there you go. Here's what my mermaid looks like after adding all the colors. Now, in terms of a color scheme, you can develop any kind of color scheme that you want for your mermaid. That's up to you. But with that being said, that's about it. That's how you draw a mermaid, start to finish. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today, I'm going to show you how to create a block of ice in Procreate. Now, here's what I have in terms of layers so far. I have the usual background color. I have it at a dark blue. I have the flat color for a cube and a couple of layers that I'm gonna reveal at the end of the video. And then I have the line work of the cube. But one of these line works doesn't have whatever it is behind it, but this one does. As you can see, there's a difference. So we're gonna focus on this line work for now, but with that being said, let's get started. So what I'm gonna do first is duplicate this layer then move it down so that way it's above the cube flat color layer. So now what I'm going to do is, so I'm going to make that top layer invisible. So this will be invisible. So let's uncheck that box. And now we're going to take this layer and we're going to invert it. So that way it's a white. So now we're going to take that layer and blur it. So we're going to go to the magic wand tool and hit Gaussian blur and now it's blurred and now hopefully you can see that but there's still some white line work throughout that cube so what we're going to do now is we're going to take this layer and we're going to duplicate it some more so that way we make the white more visible so see how that white is coming up now But see, now it doesn't really look like a Gaussian Blur. Now it just looks so flat. So now we're going to take Gaussian Blur again. And repeat that same step. Okay. But now since this layer is on top of the flat color layer. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Cube Flat Color. We're going to tap the thumbnail and hit Select. Okay. And now we're going to go down here to the bottom and hit invert so that way we're selecting everything outside of that cube so now go back to our layers now go to the white layer and then up at the top hit the arrow then we're just going to drag that portion off the screen perfect so now what we can do is we can duplicate this layer some more so that the white is still visible well, we're not going to blur it anymore so if you feel that the white is too light for this layer what you can do is take two fingers at the same time and tap on that layer and then opacity will come up so what you can do is make the opacity a smaller number and see how that white layer gets more transparent as we move down but we don't want it to be too dull so we want to move it to light somewhere close to the 70s is okay all right so now tap the magic wand tool out and now we're gonna go to this line work so we're gonna pretty much do the same thing but not exactly so what I'm going to do is make a new layer on top of it, then we're going to select my coloring brush, and now let's make this line work visible. So now we're going to follow all the other lines that don't have white parts. So like here, actually let's make that bigger. Okay. So now we're going to go to our magic wand tool again and hit Gaussian Blur. I'm going to blur it enough. And then we're going to go back to the cube flat layer. Tap the thumbnail and hit select. Invert. And drag everything else off the screen. Okay. Now we can get rid of the line work. So now let's move this layer down and we're going to keep that as a separate layer. Now let's move the cube line work layer up because when we reveal this layer at the end, it'll look super cool. So that's why we're going to keep these two on their different layers. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the cube flat layer and we're going to make another new layer. Now I'm going to go to my brushes and hit my special texture effect brush. Okay, and now since it's super huge, we're going to apply that texture all throughout the canvas. But really, we only want it inside the cube. So 
So we're gonna do what we did again. Hit cube flat layer, tap the thumbnail, hit select, invert, and everything else drag off the screen. And now it appears that the white parts on the cube are less visible now. So what we did earlier was reduce the opacity of it to make it less visible. So now let's take two fingers, tap on that layer, and make it more visible again. However, we can do that with the other line work layer. So let's go down here. We're gonna double tap that layer. And we're gonna make that a little bit visible. So that way we give the ice cube some depth. See, it's still kind of visible, but we know it's there. And it looks like we're about done. So now let me take this reveal at end layer and I'm going to reveal that so that way we see what the ice cube looks like as if there's something frozen inside of it. So, visible. Yeah, see? We got a banana frozen inside of a block of ice, which looks super cool when I apply it. But here's what the layers look like for that layer. What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons and today I'm going to show you how to create a rainbow in Adobe Illustrator. So as you can see in Illustrator already I have my color palette with all seven colors of the rainbow and then I have some cloud vectors right here. So that way when I finish the rainbow I can place these two vectors on both sides of the rainbow. But with that being said, let's get started. So what I'm going to do first is go to my shape tool. Right now I have the rectangle tool selected but I'm going to click and hold on that and I'm gonna to go to the ellipse tool right here. All right, and then I'm gonna hold the shift key and click and drag to make a perfect circle in my document, like so. All right, and we can make that any color we want for now. We'll change it later on, but I'm gonna make that like a dark blue color. All right, and now I'm gonna make a duplicate of this circle here. So I'm gonna hold the option or alt key and then I'm gonna click and drag this circle anywhere else in my document to make a copy of it. All right, and we're gonna change the color of that. We can make that any other color that we want. We'll also be changing that as well. And now I'm gonna take this newly made circle and I'm gonna make it a little smaller like so. And I'm still gonna hold the shift key so that way it's still a perfect circle, right? All right, and our two circles should look like this. So what I'm doing now is creating a ring out of these two circles. So that way, after I get rid of this brown circle here, I'm left with just this blue stripe, as you can see right now. And we're gonna make seven of those to make each stripe of our rainbow, right? So now I'm gonna click and drag to select both circles, like so. And then I'm gonna go to my Shape Builder tool, which would look like this, all right? And now I'm just gonna hover over this blue stripe here you can click and drag to make a line like this or you can just click and you can now see that it created a ring but it's now the same color of our brown circle right here so what I'm going to do is get rid of this circle right here so I'm going to go back to my selection tool I'm going to click on that circle hit the backspace or delete button and I'm going to do that one more time to get rid of this blue circle and there we go so now we're left with a ring for our rainbow. So what I'm gonna do now is take this ring, I'm gonna duplicate that about six times, so that way we can create seven stripes in total for each color of the rainbow, right? So I'm gonna hold the Option or Alt key, I'm gonna click and drag to make a copy of our circle or ring, and I'm gonna scale that down just a little bit. I'm gonna hold the Shift key so that way it stays perfect. All right, and then we're gonna simply place it in front. But I may have to scale it again, just in case. All right, and now we're left with two rings. That's one, and this is two. So now that I have two rings, I'm gonna duplicate both of these and scale both of those down. So I'm gonna click and drag to select both rings. Hold the Option or Alt key click and drag to make a copy and then scale them down all right so now we have one two three and four stripes and now let's do that one more time to create the last three stripes of our rainbow so I'm gonna click on this stripe here hold the shift key select this stripe and select the next stripe and now I'm gonna hold the option or alt key click and drag to make a copy of them then I'm going to go back to hold the shift key 
and scale them down. And then just simply place them in the middle. All right, and now if you look closely, you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rings of our circle, which will later on in the video turn into a rainbow. So now I'm gonna give color to each of these stripes here. So I'm gonna select our first stripe, that's gonna be a red color, and to quickly select the red color here, I have this stripe selected, and then I'm gonna go to my eyedropper tool, which would be right here, and then up here in my color palette, all I gotta do is use my eyedropper tool on this red here, so I'm just gonna click on it, and you can see that that stripe sampled to the red color that we have in our palette. So I'm gonna do that to all these other stripes right here. So the next stripe, that's gonna be orange. So I'm gonna click on that stripe, eyedropper tool, select the orange color that's in my palette, like so. Then the next stripe is gonna be yellow. So click on the stripe, eyedropper, yellow. Next stripe, eyedropper, green. Next stripe, eyedropper, blue. Next stripe, eyedropper, indigo. And then next stripe, eyedropper, purple, like so. And now we have a circular rainbow. But now I gotta take this rainbow and split it in half so that way it's an, an arc shape. So I'm gonna take my direct selection tool, this white arrow here, and I'm gonna make a selection of the bottom half of our rainbow because with this direct selection tool, it selects the anchor points within our vector. So I'm gonna make a rectangle selection with this tool and it's gonna help me select the anchor points that are on the bottom half of our rainbow because once we get rid of those, we get rid of the bottom half, which is what we need to do. So I'm gonna lift up off my trackpad here and you can see that if I zoom in here, that these blue anchor points that are on the bottom half of our rainbow, those are what we selected with our direct selection tool. So now that they are selected, we're gonna get rid of them by hitting the backspace or delete button. And now we have a perfect arc for our rainbow. And now because I have some cloud vectors that are down here, I'm now gonna move those onto each end of my rainbow. And in my document specifically, they're on their own separate layer. So I'm gonna quickly move this layer up above our rainbow layer. Like so, I'm gonna unlock that. And then I can take each cloud vector and simply place them on each side of our rainbow, like so. And there we go, we have a perfect rainbow vector in Adobe Illustrator. So, what's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. And today I'm gonna show you how to draw a wave. Now this video is inspiration from the most famous Japanese painting, The Great Wave of Kanagawa by Katsushika Hokusai. And the reason I brought that up is because I'll be using the organic shapes of that painting for this video. Except when you look at the painting, there's a boat in there. We won't be drawing the boat. Same with the sky. But mainly we'll just focus on the wave. Anything extra I'll probably throw in for like a few seconds and then, you know, you can do whatever. So that's what's gonna happen in today's video. So now let me run down the supplies you're gonna need. So for this video, instead of using my usual Copic markers for this video, I'm actually gonna be using some of my Ahuhu markers. You know, give them a little spotlight once in a while. But one of these markers is an off-brand marker. So it's uh, one of those cheap touch markers. I'm using 183. And it's a, a Dark Eagle marker, one of the cheap brands I found on Amazon. But Brands like this you can only get in sets, so if you are able to find a marker like this individually, then that that could also work. So I'll be using that, and then the Ahuhu markers I'm using in today's video are PB1, Peanut Butter 1, I like to say that, but it really stands for Purple Blue. Uh, PB1, 2, and 6 are the Ahuhu markers I'm going to be using, and then I'm also going to be using a Posca pen, I'm going to be using the white one. And then a little bit of my Prismacolor white colored pencil, which I often use in videos, if you know what I do on my channel. But that's what you're going to need for this video. And then I'm doing all this on Canson Bristol paper. I'm using the 7x10 paper pad or notepad or whatever. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that I will be using my Sharpie markers today. I'm using my, uh, my retractable Sharpie. 
and then I'm gonna be using big fat sharpie when I get to that portion of the video I'll tell you what that's for because I don't want to ruin the surprise just yet but anyway now that we got that covered let's go so what we're gonna do first before we get to coloring the waves we're actually gonna start by sketching the waves and it's really a no-brainer because water doesn't have a definite shape so what I'm gonna do to make this wave is I'm gonna make two parallel lines but they're gonna be c-shaped because um, these are organic shapes. So that's going to be the shape of one wave. So one C shape will be big, one will be small. And I know I said they're supposed to be parallel, but we're going to kind of break away from that for a second. So I'm going to take the little I'm going to take the little C over here. I'm going to kind of expound on that line. Make sure it goes all the way out here. This one we actually won't be doing that with. So for the composition of this drawing, I'm actually going to make like another small wave over here. So that'll be another piece of water, I guess I should say. Now this same concept that we did with these two letter C's, we're going to make another one but smaller. So in other words, if you're doing this digitally, we're going to duplicate these two lines and make them smaller. And remember this line will come out. Okay, and now on the other side of these two lines, that's where we'll, that's where we'll begin to make the shape of the wave. I mean, this C shape kind of does look like a wave, but, but I'm going to create a different shape that'll make it look more like a wave. So I'm going to come back here and make a slope that goes up. Then it's going to come back down because now up here we're at the crest of the wave. like that and then once we get to a point where we can stop at we're gonna come back and loop so it touches one of these letter C shapes but actually we can make it like this now as you can see I gave the wave a little bit more depth so what I'm going to establish right now at this point in the video, I'm going to make this portion here. That's going to be where most of the darker blues are. Now you don't have to shade it like I did with the pencil because we'll be erasing this later. But just so we have a clear understanding of where the shades are going to go. So this portion of the wave will be lighter than this portion of the wave. And the same goes for this side. So let me go ahead and draw that in right quick. Same deal just smaller so what I'm gonna do instead if you're not happy with the spacing or the actual organic shapes you can always alter it because right now we're in the sketching phase so any trial and error that you do you can always fix at this stage because at the final stage there's really no going back if you're doing this traditionally so I'm gonna make that wave come out a little bit more yeah because I felt like those waves were kind of spaced too close together and now sketch that in to establish where the shades are gonna go making that a little bit easier that line come out some more and then make that line come out some more and like I said anything else you want to fix you better do it now or forever hold your peace okay so now I got to a point where I'm good pretty much so now I'm gonna take my needed eraser and I'm gonna erase the lines to an extent where I can still see them but so they're barely barely visible
Hopefully you don't see the other wave that I erase. But yeah, you get the understanding. So now we're at the point where we can begin coloring. So I'm going to take my base color, which is this cheap Dark Eagle marker. It's number 183. Again, this is a cheap marker that I hope you can find individually. But again, you don't have to. But like Hobby Lobby, I think, sells markers like these individually, like cheap touch twin markers with numbers on them. The color is phalo blue, if I'm pronouncing that right. But we're going to use this as a base color. And keep in mind, what I'm doing here is making the lines uh, streaky. Because let's say you're Googling an image of water, you might see streaks in the water. But as I make these streaks on this paper, I'm kind of capturing the movement of the water because like I said, it doesn't have a definite shape because it's always moving. Especially since this is a wave. So it's, you know, kind of vital to capture that kind of movement. And I'm going to do that with the inside of the wave. See how I'm following the shape of the C shape that we made earlier. That's what we got to do. And then we can kind of extend those lines out just so they hit close to the edge of the page. Or that's something I want to do. That's my preference. But again, so they follow those same guidelines that I um, think I can't erase because I applied marker on top of it already. Okay, now on the other parts of the wave, what I'm going to do with the marker now is uh, make like a circular motion just to help separate that out. So I know what portion of the waves to shade and which ones not to. Because I think at this point, the guidelines are now not visible or if not that they're kind of hard to see and another way you can do this is that you can layer on top of layers so that way this, the ink that this marker lays down is like I'd say more saturated or more ink or more solidified however you're gonna do it just so you can help separate it out from those streaky lines it's probably easy to tell if you do it just once, but, you know, do what you have to do. Okay, so we're good for adding the base color. So now what I'm going to do is, instead of working from light to dark like I usually do, I'm actually going to take my darkest marker, which is Peanut Butter 6, PB6. Again, that's purple, blue, and a hoo-hoo. So I'm going to apply the darkest shades to the wave. You can see that's a very dark blue. Well, dark in comparison with the base color blue. So I'm just going to apply that. I'm actually going to create sort of a cast shadow. Like see this movement of water here? I'm going to create a cast shadow behind it so that it's on this wave. And I can do that over here as well. And then I'm also going to apply some shading right underneath the crest of the wave because once we add the white paint pen, it'll really make sense why we're adding shade there. So again, you can also layer in this area too, just so you can get a very, very dark blue. It might be difficult to blend later, so just comp contemplate that. And then you can apply like a lot of ink there. Like say I'm adding this to a big area here. I'm gonna do the same thing here. And 
gonna add a little bit of this blue onto the wave I would say that's in the foreground because it's the wave that's coming closer to us so that's why I say it's the foreground and then you see how I add a few accents to this wave using this color you can also do that because when we apply our next color we can really blend those out But if you want the lines to be solid and sharp, that's still fine too. Because after we add all the other colors to help blend these other lines out, we can still add this marker on top to like accent it in a way. Or to keep these lines sharp, I, I would say. So will just add like accents to the wave right here. And I think we're good at this step. Okay, so let me grab my mid-tone. Uh, which is peanut butter number two. This is a uh, brilliant blue Because you see how it's a uh, more saturated than this than the last blue that we pulled out It is more saturated, but it, it goes together and it helps blend so that's why I picked this color for this video And then I'm gonna apply lots of this mid-tone over here because again, this area is a cast shadow. And then up here as well. I think I already did it, but let me do it again. Alright, now that I'm done applying that, I can go ahead with my peanut butter one. I'm not going to color over the entire thing because this is a light color, but it's not the base color that I use. So I'm just going to uh, expound on the blending. Okay, now I'm done applying the peanut butter one. I'm gonna go back with my base color and blend everything back together. Okay, so now we're at the point where we're about finished adding shades to the waves. So now it's kind of looking a little bare because the outer parts of these waves are super plain. There's no shading added onto them just yet. So this will be a little bit difficult, just a little heads up, because this portion may seem a little bit dry after adding the shades and everything to every other part of the drawing. So this will be a little bit difficult, but I am going to use my mid-tone to add some shading to the waves. My mid-tone is peanut butter one. And if you need to, you can add peanut butter too. But if you're adding shading to this, do not use peanut butter six because that's your darkest color. And again, we don't want to mix that up with the shading we applied to the inside of the waves. So that's why I use PB1 and PB2, but don't go any darker than PB2 because, you know. So I'm going to quickly do that in time lapse and then we can proceed to the next step. Okay, so now we're at this point in the video where we can add a background because after then we'll be applying the white paint pen and applying that on top of a white background 
that won't do. So that's why I'm gonna bring in my big fat Sharpie and my other Sharpie so we can begin to solidify these lines. So I'm gonna use my retractable Sharpie and just go around the shape of the wave. And just make that black. So we can give this entire drawing a black background. And if we give it a black background, we can definitely see the white paint pen after we apply it. Okay, and then we can use our big fat Sharpie and color in everything else. <coughs> now it stinks in here. But anyway, we got the black background. So next thing we're gonna do is our apply our white paint pen. But before we do, we're gonna give that a little shake. So first, let's apply some white paint pen to this layer of water. So again, water has a definite shape. So when you apply the white paint pen, there's no definite shape either. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of make some scribbles along the edges of what we drew. And if you want, you can just like do a couple dabs just to give a sensation of water. And then here. And then when we come up to the wave, we can pretty much do the same thing. Just do some scribbles. And then if your paint does seem transparent, you may have to let it dry and then go over in another coat, which is kind of what I am doing. And then just, you know, touch up the edges with a couple dabs because there could be drops of water falling from the crest of the wave, which you can definitely see. Just apply the white, add some dabs here and there. And if you got a different size nib, Posca pen, I guess you should say, you can definitely add smaller spots or thinner spots, however you're gonna say it. But I got a felt tip, so I gotta stick with what I got. And really, the drops of water falling from the crest, they don't exactly have to be at the crest or falling off of it. It can just be literally anywhere. Because, keep in mind, this is water. Again, it doesn't have a definite shape. So, if there is like a lot of water, considering how big a wave is, drops of water could be everywhere. So, that's what I'm actually going to do. Just drops of water everywhere. I'm gonna simulate that with some white dots. Okay, now before we end the video, there's one more thing we gotta do. So I'm gonna take my white colored pencil or if you have a gel pen, you can, always, you can also use that. But what I'm gonna do is add some shine to the movement of the waves because again that's the shading portion or supposedly the shading portion so I'm gonna add some white color pencil to help highlight that some of the darkest parts that we use to simulate the movement of the waves we can highlight those with the white colored pencil So I accidentally did this off camera, but I applied more shading along the wave just to help give it some contrast because earlier it was kind of clashing with the color of the back of this wave. So let's compare this to Hokusai's painting. So here we got the main wave, that's what I did, and I also included like a foreground wave. I want to call it a foreground wave. But before making this video, I honestly thought there was a second wave in the painting. 
but at the same time I also thought that I should put this wave in this video just to help fill that negative space because I wasn't gonna make this one super big like it is in the painting because my ultimate goal wasn't to make it exactly how the painting is but get inspiration off it but if you take a look at the foreground wave there's no boat or canoe or such there's no canoes at all in my drawing but there's two in Hokusai's painting but yeah, with that being said, that's how you draw a wave using markers, colored pencils, and a paint pen. But if you do want to do this with Copic markers, I will put a list of equivalent Copic colors somewhere on the screen so that way you can do this with Copic markers. But with that being said, that's it. What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons and today I'm going to show you guys how to draw a desert. Now for this video, I'm going to show you guys how to draw one start to finish. And instead of coloring it in my sketchbook, you know, markers, colored pencil, mixed media, you know how I do. Instead of doing that, I'm going to take the finished drawing into Procreate and color it there. So let's get to it. So when I'm drawing any kind of environment, I like to start out with the foreground, then work our way towards the middle ground, and then work our way towards the background. So the foreground is pretty much what we will see first because you see how my hands are in the camera? that's where the foreground is. So that's the part of the drawing that we'll end up seeing first. So before we draw one, let's think. What does a desert have? Sand, cacti, and like big large, I'd say red rocks. What I was thinking is that we can draw two cacti, one on this side, one on the other side, but one will kind of go like a little off the page. So let's say this one on this side can go off the page, the one that's going to be over here, it can be close to the edge of the page, but it won't like be cut off in any way. So when I'm drawing cactuses, I like to make an upside down tear shape. And I like to make it a little bit curvy, something like this. And then make like a stem which will kind of uh, reflect that shape. And I know I said the cactus won't be cut off, but we want to make room for the entire desert. Because the cactus I drew already takes up about a third of the page. So we want to make room for, you know, everything else. The cactus will end up being cut off, but not very much. And then this other one can go like, uh, something like this. And it can also have one of those arms as well. Okay, and then what you can also do is you can make sort of like small sand hills. And that looks good in a foreground. And then maybe I want to include some, you know, like small cactuses with like this kind of shape. And then have it like, um, have like a little flower on it. And I put it on this side because this cactus is kind of being cut off like on the edge of the page. So I included that there to give some sort of balance to the piece. Or at least to the foreground. But you guys get it. But yeah, I drew this cactus. And that really completes the foreground really. But also, since we're drawing cactuses, cactuses have spikes on them. So I'm not going to focus too much on the spikes. Because I want to make the spikes on the cactus sort of like an after effect. Something that I can put on the cactuses after I finish coloring it. But since we're not at that stage yet, we're just going to ink the cactuses how they are. Alright, so our foreground is drawn now. Now we can transition forward and work towards the middle ground. So when we draw the middle ground, we can make like a horizon line if we want. I'm going to place it, like say, right about here is a good spot. And then, what else do deserts have? Deserts have like sand hills, desert plants. When I do the sand hills, I like to make like one big hill. Coming down and coming back up. Sort of like an M shape or like a wavelength or you know but you know in short draw this shape <laughs> and then what I like to do when I'm drawing deserts I like to make some sort of a pathway something like this it's not gonna actually be a pathway it'll be just like a pathway of sand okay so we got our pathway it's not exactly gonna look like this when I ink it 
it's just gonna look like it was pushed away with some sand almost. I'm just gonna include like patches of sand along this line maybe, along this line too. So what else can we draw? We can draw like more desert plants. We can draw more of cactuses that look like this. Um, maybe a tiny cactus that looks like this as well. And uh, whatever other desert plants there are. So I'm gonna include another one of these cactuses over here. And then maybe a desert plant. I don't know what this is called, but a desert has like a very dry climate. So maybe like a fresh leafy green plant that may have dried up or maybe a soon to form tumbleweed. I don't know an exact name for it, but it's gonna look like a bunch of straws put together. <laughs> like that's my way of describing it, but um, hopefully you can get a feel of what I'm talking about because I'm drawing it. Yeah, the desert plant that I'm drawing, it'll, it'll look like this. And then I'm just gonna add maybe like some patches of sand here and there. And sand has some dots that I wanna include as well. And then behind it all, we can still include this as a middle ground. We can add like another hill that kind of reflects the ones that we just drew. Of course, this portion of the drawing won't be seen as much, but it gives us like an extra space to work with. So we can draw like another cactus. I'd say right about here is a good spot. Of course, it's at a distance, so it's not going to be the same size as these two ones. Then maybe we could add another one back here. And if you want to make this pathway continuous, as if you want to place it like right over here, you can do that. Or if your pathway isn't shown at this portion of the drawing, then you don't have to include it. But yeah, so these two hills are both the middle ground. All right, now that the foreground and middle ground are already drawn, now we can go all the way to the back and do the background. For the background, I like to get rid of this horizon line. Let's think, what else do deserts have? Like I mentioned before, deserts have like big, I wanna say red rocks. I don't know the name for those kind of rocks, but that's what we're gonna draw because I see it on deserts a lot. So when I'm drawing this kind of rock, let's draw one right back here. I like to make it into like a cube and have a little, another rock right next to it, like so. Then we're gonna draw like another one over here, but it's not gonna be the same shape as this. So it's gonna be like oddly shaped because it's a rock, it's made by nature. So it's not gonna have like an exact cube shape or an exact spherical shape or an exact pyramid shape. So that's why it's okay to go crazy with this kind of rock structure, which is kind of what I just did. And then you can make the rocks a little bit jaggedy if you want. But of course, they're all the way in the background. So any textures that you might want to add, like if the texture is that much visible from all the way back here, then it's okay to include it. Like all the smallest details on a rock, you don't need to include because, you know, the rock is way back here. So maybe like a crack in it, maybe. Like that could be a good detail. And like some jaggedy lines up here and also on the side. So when you're doing texture, you don't necessarily have to go with every single detail. Just go with the ones that you feel you can see from a distance. So let's go over here. You can make like a jaggedy lines up here. Make it look good. And then we got some empty space right here. What can we put there? We can put maybe another hill. Keep in mind, we're still in the sketching phase. So if it doesn't work out, you can just erase it and try something different. And I think that kind of looks good. Maybe we can include that pathway. But it's gonna be super small compared to what we drew here because it's at a distance. And it's kind of weird that there's no continuation of this pathway on this hill because maybe the pathway continues past this cactus shape here, which obviously we won't see because you know the cactus is in the way, it's behind it. And then the pathway continues all the way over here. So we could say that we got the foreground, middle ground, and the background could be the rocks, and then an additional sand hill over here. That we can place as the background. But you can also consider the sky. Like say you can add some clouds. I wanna space them out a little bit because I don't want them too close to the rocks. 
and maybe like a small cloud here just to fill that negative space. But we also want the picture to breathe. So we don't exactly want to fill this entire area until it can't take anymore, you know? But yeah, there's our desert. Let me ink the rest of it and then come back to you guys. All right, and that's our fully drawn desert. Now, like I said from the now, like I said from the beginning, I'm gonna take this drawing into Procreate, give it some color, and then explain to you what I did. So let's go. All right, and that's how you color a desert. Here's my layer lineup so you guys can see how exactly I added some color. The cacti and the rocks have their own separate layers for shading. And for the cacti, I made a layer for the stripy pattern and a layer for the spikes. For the sand, I had to use two different layers for the shading and then an additional layer for the texture throughout. I also kept the highlights on a separate layer so then I can make it into a clipping mask layer and add some color. That way I'd be giving my piece colored highlights. But that's pretty much all I have to say about the drawing. What's good everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons. Today I'm going to show you how to draw someone wearing a life jacket. Now as you can see I got a person here already and this is a medium shot. So I captured the head, uh, the torso, and then a small part of the lower body. So that's a medium shot. But this is what I'm going to use as a guide to help show you guys how to draw someone wearing a life jacket. So let's get started. So a life jacket or a life vest, some people may call it. I'm just gonna make like a V-neck over here. So it's gonna be like a neckline with the letter V, like that. And then we're just really, for now we're just making it into a vest. And I have like a little badge right here. This can be anything, but I'm just gonna draw that there as um, a slight decoration. And then over to the middle, I'm gonna stop the vest close to the bottom of the shirt. Like see, this line indicates the bottom of the shirt. I'm gonna stop right before then. So it's gonna be right about here. Okay, and then right here in the middle is gonna be a couple um, sewn on straps with buckles to help kind of lock the vest in or to keep it attached to the body. So what I'm gonna do is draw some, some buckles. I'm gonna draw like three. I'm not gonna go too precise with them, just draw three rectangles. And then coming off of the rectangles on both sides like this, those can be some straps to help hold it in place. And they can be black to help separate them out. So that's what I'm gonna do to all the other rectangles that I drew. And then I'm gonna even them out over here. Okay, and then I'm gonna erase this center line too. That way we just have buckles. And then since the torso is kind of curved over here in this area, what we can do now is simplify the contours of the life jacket itself. So let's try to disregard all the lines for the body. If you have the body drawn, try to disregard the torso lines because before drawing the life jacket you can see that there was a curve here and a curve down here as well so what we're gonna do is uh, really smoothen that out because the life jacket makes it thicker in comparison so we're gonna draw like a, a swift line 
going straight from here and to here. I mean, there's gonna be like a little curve right here, but you know, just smoothing it out. And actually, before you draw this line, you can actually make the life vest itself a little bit thicker by coming outwards. And you see how thick that is? That's what we're gonna do to the entire life jacket. So let's do it on this side as well. So you see where the line is from the back of the torso. We're gonna make that same line just uh, further from it. And then just erase that line. And there. And then what I'm gonna do up here is apply some depth to it. Just uh, give it some thickness by adding a whole nother line that matches the contour. Or at least to that specific part because this is at a three quarter view as well so try to consider that. And then I'm gonna make this a little bit more curved over here as well. And you see like over here to the edge where the shoulder is, I added a curve right here to make the life vest look like it's thicker than what it was before. That's what I kind of did over here. Then again, it's a three quarter view. So we also want to consider how much of a curve we make, especially on this side. So more of that curve will be visible on this side because you know, we're seeing this first. And then I'm up. Okay. And then to help make the life vest look like it's sort of tight on the body, what I am gonna do is emphasize the shirt. Cause you see um, a small portion of the shirt is still showing. So what I'm, what I'm gonna do is make the shirt come outward a bit. And do something like this. Just give it a few curves. And then a few tension spots close to the life vest. Just a few lines. And then the pants, we don't have to really do much with that, but we can just draw those in. And yeah, we're pretty much done at this point. So what I'm gonna do now is just add like an extra decoration, I guess you wanna say, or design to the life jacket. I'm gonna add like this uh, little curve line. And then I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger because I don't want this thing to be too tight on this character. So I'm just gonna space it out a tiny bit. And yeah, so what I'm gonna do now is give this character some inks and then come back to you guys and end the video. All right, and there you go. That's how you draw someone wearing a life vest. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to Cadillac Cartoons, and today I'm gonna show you how to draw the male torso. So, let's get started. So the first thing that I'm gonna do when drawing the male torso is begin by making the neck. And I'm gonna make that in the center of my page by just drawing two small lines. They look kinda like parentheses. Hopefully you can see that, but they look like parentheses if you can't. And now what I'm gonna do is make uh, two sloping lines coming off of each of those lines going out. So this line is gonna have some sort of angle to it. It's going that way, coming from this line that's on the right. I'm gonna do the exact opposite on the other side. And then I'm just gonna construct the shoulders just a little bit. And those are the deltoids, so it's gonna have some sort of a curve to it. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. 
I'm not going to do much to it because um, we're going to draw the body first before drawing the arms because we don't want the arms to be in the way of anything. So that's why we're going to focus on the arms last. But now that we got that in place, let's now draw a line of symmetry. So since I have my uh, Canton Mixed Media paper here, I can just make a line that goes down like this. Or if you have a ruler, you can use that too. But um, actually, let me darken that real quick with my pencil. So you guys can see that, okay? And now to make the male torso, we're gonna start off with a rectangle, like a big rectangle that goes through this line. So after it goes through this line, it'll come off as squares. And that's gonna be the chest. So one big rectangle or squares, however you wanna see it, I'm gonna draw that in. And everything is going to be symmetrical, so it's going to be the same on both sides of this line of symmetry. Okay. And now what we're going to do is going to make a trapezoid kind of shape that goes inwards by a lot. And it's going to be connected to this rectangle that we just drew. So this is how it's going to be connected. Like this. So rectangle and smaller trapezoid right underneath it. Okay. And then right underneath the trapezoid, I'm going to draw like a little square. Square right here. May look slightly like a rectangle, but that's okay. But those are all the basic shapes that we're going to need to draw in the male torso. And then anywhere that's past this square will be the hips, the crotch, and everything else. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay, so coming up here to where the chest is, you see how this square has some sort of an angle to it? We're actually going to make that curved. I'm going to trace this line a little bit and make it into a curve instead of a straight line like the square is. Okay. And then right here where the line of symmetry is, we can do the same thing but just not as much. Like that. And now coming to the trapezoid shape, we can make a curve around those straight lines like this. And then at the bottom of that curve, we can begin to make a, like a very slight S shape coming down to the bottom of this square. So you see how there's like an S curve, it goes, it curves this way, and then that way. And then we're going to make a different curve on the other side, so it's going to come this way, and then out, and then come to the bottom, like that. Okay, and then here's a straight line where this square is. We're gonna make a curve around that as well. And there we go. So we're not done yet. So what I am gonna do is make the hips a little bit wider by adding a slight curve to the bottom and just erasing the lines that we don't need and kind of extending that curve. Like that. And now these two ends, where I'm gonna make this X, if you can see it, X here and X here, those are the hips. And when we draw the boxers, we're gonna start there, but we're not there yet. Because now what we're gonna draw is the abdomen. So, I'm gonna draw like a little uh, arc shape that goes all the way up to this trapezoid. 
and make somewhat like a door, like a door shape kind of. And as you can see with the line of symmetry, it kind of looks like we're making a six pack. Well, we're gonna do that too. But since we already have a line here from the trapezoid, we can draw another line that goes right underneath it. That way we have one, two, three, four, five, six sections to make a six pack, okay? So now we're gonna take the curves on this door shape. I'm just gonna make a small line like that. And that's part of the abdomen. And right before we get to drawing the six pack, I'm gonna pick a point on this door shape. I'm gonna make somewhat of an angular line that marks where the crotch is. And again, doing that on the other side of the line of symmetry as well. And there we go. So now we can get to drawing the six pack. So you see this shape over here where I made one square like kind of overlap the other. That's what we're gonna do when we're drawing the six pack. So all we gotta do is you see there's, so to make that you see how there's an angle with the line of symmetry and this like little guideline here for the trapezoid, that's gonna help us. So we're just gonna make that into a curve and then make it into a slight curve over here, like that. And then do the same thing to this next one. And then we can do it again for one last one just above this line because we don't wanna make it too close to the bottom. And then extend these curves a little bit if you want. And there we go. So we got the chest, the abdomen, and the hips drawn. And now we can add a little bit extra to this uh, male torso. So I'm going to take my Prismacolor Collie Race pencil. And I'm just going to extend it a little bit. Coming down. Just to make the legs. So on this line of symmetry. Or using these angular lines. We can make the crotch which looks like a bag hanging off of something. Okay, and then we can make the legs on each side of the line of symmetry. My symmetry looks a little bit off, but that's okay. And then we don't have to do much from here because all we're drawing are the thighs of the legs. If you do have a larger piece of paper, because you know mine stops here, if you do have a longer piece of paper and you want to draw the rest of the legs, you can do that as well. And if you want to learn from me how to draw the legs, I got videos right here in the card. If you want to learn how to draw legs, female legs, and anything else similar to it. And there will also be links in the description to that as well. But in this case, we're just going to focus on drawing like the top portion of the thighs. And then, now that we got that drawn, I can... Uh, quickly sketch in some boxers and then just give that a little bit of an outline like that Okay, and then all we have left to do is to draw in the arms. So following the principles of anatomy, the arms, including the hand, stop at the mid thigh. So typically the arm will stop right about here. So what I am gonna do is from the shoulders, which we already drew here, I'm gonna draw a circle. I'm just going to draw a straight line like that. And another straight line that's about the same length. And then from this dot to this X will be the size of the hand. And I'm just going to come off of this little curve, the deltoid. I'm just gonna make the arm like that. I'm just gonna use like a 
a distorted cylinder kind of shape for the arm. And then I'm gonna make a curve from the elbow to the wrist because you know that's what I do when drawing arms. And then I'm just gonna quickly sketch in a random hand movement. But if you do wanna learn from me how to draw the hand as well, I got three videos on drawing the hands. Two of them are public on YouTube. And the last one is available on my Patreon. So in the description, there's gonna be two links to both those videos. And there will also be a link to my Patreon so you can get to that other hand video too, if you want. But for now, I'm just gonna Draw in just a basic hand movement like this. Don't need to go very fancy with it, but um, that's what we got. And now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side, but I'm gonna time lapse that because you know this took not forever, but it took some time to do. And all you're really doing on this side is the same thing because, like I said, this entire thing, because it's a line of symmetry, it's gonna be symmetrical. It's gonna look the same on the other side. So again, I'm gonna do that in time lapse and then come back to you guys. All right, and after adding the other arm, we're pretty much done at this point. That's how you draw the male torso. So if you liked the video or if you found it useful, give it a like and a comment. Subscribe if you haven't and tap the notification bell so you never miss an upload. And I'll see you in my next video.